one year ago, on November 24, 2022, Anwar Ibrahim was sworn in as Malaysia's 10th Prime Minister. Saya, Anwar bin Ibrahim, setelah dilantik memegang jawatan seorang Perdana Menteri. In the face of political instability and a nation yearning for change, has he risen to the challenge? Masa pentadbiran juga buat, kita saya mau kembali balik! And what is still a work in progress? A lot of these things are nice ideas, but a lot of the changes that you see take a long time to become visible. One year ago, law student Omar Kayum was studying in the US. From afar, he watched as Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim formed a unity government in his home country of Malaysia. At the time, Omar was unsure if the new government would complete its term. The past general elections, there were um, a few conflicts about how backdoor governments happen and everything. Of course, there are certain worries, but I don't think that's something within our control if it happens. To understand Omar's unease is to go back to November 19, 2022, the day of Malaysia's 15th general election. Anwar's Pakatan Harapan Coalition, or PH, had won 82 seats. Chief rival, Muhyiddin Yassin's Perikatan Nasional, or PN, clinched 74. Neither had enough for a simple majority in Malaysia's 222-seat parliament. For the first time in its history, Malaysia faced a hung parliament. Start seeing people jumping from one party to the other, parties that you never thought would shake hands, then join together. and So it became really confusing as to who do you really want to support. To resolve the stalemate, Malaysia's king suggested the formation of a unity government. Anwar would emerge victorious from the horse trading by teaming up with parties from East Malaysia as well as the Barisan National Coalition led by AMNO, the United Malays National Organization. I think Anwar and also the Pakatan Harapan political leadership is also aware that their Malay support is relatively thin on the ground and that they need a stronger Malay partner uh, to represent that particular interest in the coalition government and AMNO provides that. If you look at AMNO positions, uh, joining PH is the best option. They have different strongholds, therefore they can complement each other. But it was not a straightforward alliance. After all, this was not the first time PH had won a general election. With former Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir Mohamad and Anwar at the helm, PH triumphed in 2018. They pried AMNO from its six-decade hold on power. Dr. Mahathir Mohamad would become the Premier, and PH was in charge. AMNO, which had been plagued by corruption scandals, was relegated to the opposition. But Mahathir's tenure would be cut short. In February 2020, the PH government was toppled in what became known as the Sheraton Move. Parties that formed the coalition back in 2018 uh, broke apart and some left to join with the opposition to form a new government. And during that period, there was a great deal of uh, voter concern about the stability of government, about the durability of any administration that could be formed. And along with it, the concerns arose because it affects them directly. Muhyiddin was among those who defected from the PH government. He would become the next PM, backed by AMNO. He would then resign in 2021, replaced by AMNO's Ismail Sabri in the top job. So, in forming the current unity government, Anwar was teaming up with his erstwhile bitter rivals, AMNO. The was formed. It was a coalition of parties that had been prior to that uh, strong adversaries, long-term adversaries with very serious uh, allegations and also uh, you know, bad history uh, between them. So voters were very doubtful that any administration can be formed out of a coalition of convenience, uh, out of 
former enemies that suddenly turn to be cooperating partners. People fear that Anwar may not last his full term because that there's a possibility that AMNO or the East Malaysian parties may pull out. But so far, it seems that this is not happening. Against the odds, the unity government has kept together for the first year. To insiders, the alliance made sense. After 1998, when Latuk Sri Anwar was uh, arrested, Latuk Sri Zahid was put under ISA because they were accused of uh, trying to topple Tun Lok Tamade. Um, uh, that friendship has endured until today. And, but today, the difference is they are leading the government. While it is true that uh, AMNO would be seen as a Malay-based uh, political party, but they are also the leader of Barisan Nasional, which happened to be a coalition of uh, different political parties representing different identities in Malaysia. It is much easier for us to manage um, the situation, especially in terms of the national narrative, that we want unity. Then came the appointment of cabinet ministers. Anwar has actually been able to keep this very sprawling coalition together through a very, I would say, judicious cabinet appointments to be able to make sure that all of the different parties had a vested interest in staying in government. Anwar's deputy prime ministers hail from new partners, Barisan National and the Sarawak Party's Alliance. Barisan National and the Borneo Bloc each received six ministerships. The Democratic Action Party, or DAP, the party with the most seats in the ruling coalition, had only four ministers. Youth and Sports Minister Hannah Yeo from the DAP takes it all in stride. I will not accept that, uh, that we are less effective just because we are smaller in numbers in uh, representation in the government. Yep. I, I think everything we do as ministers, leading our ministries, will definitely help to strengthen government. And uh, therefore, every minister has an equal opportunity uh, to carry uh, the load and to showcase what the cabinet and what this government has to offer. One appointment raised eyebrows. At the time, Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, who was appointed Deputy Prime Minister, had 47 corruption-related charges hanging over him. This was awkward for Anwar, whose reformasi movement denounced corruption. There is some controversy to most leaders, and namely some like Zahid and stuff like that, they are known for a lot of corruption and stuff like that, and you weren't properly prosecuted nor acquitted from the court. So then you have them be your deputy prime minister. Well, you know, he doesn't really have much of a choice. It is a coalition government and Zaid Hamidi is the president of AMNO, which is the second largest party in parliament uh, that was willing to form a coalition of partnership with Anwar. Because of our system, the leader of that party becomes the leader in government as well. Then, in September 2023, the Malaysian High Court dismissed Zahid's charges in a discharge not amounting to an acquittal. Prime Minister Anwar was quick to say he had no hand in the court's decision. Bila peguam negara buat keputusan, saya tanya dia betul. Saya bukan bincang keputusan dia. Saya tanya dia apa alasan. Itu dia bagi 11 alasan. But optically, this could be damaging. This has given Perikatan Nasional a lot of ammunition. And it has given or allowed it to take the high ground with regards to governance and anti-corruption. It sent the wrong message that you are innocent until you lose power. And you regain your innocence when you regain power. So this is a big dark crowd shadowing Anwar's government. Saya rasa secara jujurnya um, dia bukan satu episod yang mudah untuk uh, kerajaan sendiri um, uh, hadapi uh, keyakinan orang ramai itu agak uh, terjejas uh, berkait dengan keputusan yang dibuat oleh mahkamah. Uh, tapi kita harus nilai what follows after, apa yang uh, berlaku selepas itu. Pengasingan kuasa uh, antara pendakwa raya dan juga peguam 
negara. Itu berlaku menjadikan uh, integriti uh, sistem kehakiman dan sistem um, legislatif uh, pengasingan kuasa itu um, seharusnya boleh berlaku dengan lebih berkesan. In the fallout, Syed Sadiq, who led the Malaysian United Democratic Alliance or MUDA, quit the PH government in protest. Little did I expect that um, a so-called reform government would actually be the one to drop the 47 criminal charges. And there's no two way around it. You cannot say that it's the judge, you cannot say that it's the court. It is the government appointed attorney general and newly appointed deputy public prosecutor. Well, I think for Muda, while the road ahead will be tough and full with challenges and confrontations, I think at least we're able um, to, to defend our principles and ideals and to chart the way forward for better and newer Malaysia. Sadiq himself was under corruption investigations at the time. He would eventually be convicted. With Muda's departure, Anwar lost his two-third parliamentary supermajority, at least temporarily. There were other criticisms from the opposition. Yeah, I put some hope that he'd be able to introduce the changes that he has promised during his years as a reformist and also as a, someone who has been fighting for change for the country. But somehow, the moment he became Prime Minister, the very first thing that actually he really disappoints me is that the appointment of Nuru Iza as one of the advisors in the office. Because this just shows how hypocrite he is. This is chronism, this is nepotism. These are the things that he has said against before, but he's doing it as a Prime Minister. We have to agree. Uh, to the saying that to test a man's character, give him power. And I think this is just to show when you give power to Anwar, this is the true Anwar Ibrahim for Malaysian people to judge. Despite the controversies, Anwar has successfully kept his unity government together in his first year. We must never forget how this government came into place. Uh, right after the general elections, when nobody had a clear majority to form government, just trying to hold everybody together from various background, uh, that itself I think is a feat. Will unity in the government translate to success in Anwar's mission to unify Malaysians? Two months into his term, Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim unveiled his unity government's slogan, Malaysia Madani, or Civil Malaysia. The Madani concept that Anwar has been speaking about is something that he's been talking about since these days as a Deputy Prime Minister back in the 90s. There was a vision back in the day that it was going to be a more liberal, more democratic, more inclusive society where uh, race and to some extent class is not a demarcator of, uh, you know, what someone is. Yet, state elections held in August 2023 revealed a Malaysia that still voted along racial lines. Pre-election surveys showed that a majority of Malay voters in Chenganu, Kedah and Kelantan preferred Perikatan Nasional. When the election results were announced, it appeared that the status quo remained. The Pakatan Harapan Barisan National Coalition and its rivals, Perikata National, retained control of three states each. Looking deeper, the Conservative opposition had wrested key Malay majority seats from the ruling coalition, flipping seats in the PHBN strongholds of Penang, Selangor and Negri Sembilan. The Malay Muslim support is critical for any government here in Malaysia, partly because of demographics. Uh, you know, in the younger generations of Malaysians, you know, Muslims make up 70-75%. The Malaysian population in the future will be more Malay than what it is now. And given that uh, voters can now start, they can choose from 18 years old, uh, they become more and more important. In Selangor, Parikata Nasional swept 22 seats up from the six it held before the state elections. Taman Medan is one seat that turned blue. Dia datang, lepas tu dia kata apa? Ahli Parlimen kata apa? Dia ada nak panggil COB ke apa tak ada? Tapi bila saya tanya hari ni, 
Lagi tak ada pesan tak duduk. Today, its newly minted representative, Dr. Afif Bahardin, is visiting residents in his ward. In 2022, he was sacked from Anwar's People's Justice Party, or PKR, after independently meeting with then Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. Dr. Afif is now a member of Muhyiddin's Bersatu, part of the opposition. I chose Bersatu because I believe Bersatu being a nationalist party still focus on the issues and also the struggle that the people are facing every day. The problem that we face now, the current Madani administration, they do not enjoy the Malay majority support. Reason being because they cannot accept how AMNO, Zahid Hamini, be able to sit down with the AP and even with PKR to form a government, so-called unity government. Because to the Malays, in order to protect the interests of the Malays, they believe the Perikatan National Coalition has been able to actually represent the Malays and also be able to represent the whole Malaysia. In Malaysia, people talk about Green Wave, but there are actually two episodes of Green Wave. In Green Wave 1.0, it's about new voters. In the GE15, last November, we have 4.9 million new voters in the peninsula, and PN won 2.6 million. So, what you can say is that out of those new voters, more than half of them chose PN for various reasons. But in Green Wave 2.0, AMNO voters no longer have three choices. So they are forced to choose between PH AMNO and PN. And so there are bound to be some attritions from AMNO towards PN because ideologically they are closer. 60-year-old Abdul Halim Idris made that switch from AMNO to PN. He was previously an active grassroots member of AMNO. Saya memang keluarga daripada keluarga AMNO, daripada datuk, nenek semua kan. Ibu bapa saya semua AMNO dan kampung ni adalah 100% AMNO. Jadi pemimpin AMNO ni lepas pada Najib Kita dah tengok, dah tak ada hala tuju. Masing-masing memikirkan kepentingan masing-masing. Jadi dalam sisi perang raya yang akhir-akhir ini lah daripada 14-15 ini, rakyat tolak. Sebab masyarakat tak terima pemimpin-pemimpin UMNO. Sebab imej dia, pemimpin UMNO itu dah tercala. In the 2023 state elections, Abdul Halim made the decision to jump ship for the first time since he became eligible to vote, he did not mark UMNO on his voting sheet. Dululah perjuangan ni adalah perjuangan kerana bangsa, negara dan agama. Itu bagi saya, ya memang itu perjuangan asal UMNO, asasnya lah. Eh. Tapi sekarang ni dah lain. Voters like Abdul Halim leave Anwar with a dilemma. Push for multiculturalism and risk alienating Malay voters, or appease Malay voters and jeopardize his Madani project. Reform means different things to different people. And to certainly one important base for him, which is non-Malay voters, many of which are living in urban areas, it has to do with the protection of multiculturalism, progressive policies, policies oriented to bridging the gap. Then you have uh, a lot of voters in more rural areas, you know, Malay majority constituencies, that it is much more about uh, the protection of certain rights or policies that are important to them. And it is this duality that I think means it's quite difficult, not just for Anwar, for anyone. To, to kind of try and deal with these competing considerations. In his first year, Anwar appears to have leaned towards the latter, reassuring Malay Muslim voters. We've seen a number of policies, like increasing the budget of JAKIM, the federal um, agency in charge of, of religion or Islam. We've also seen a discussion you know, a revival of a long-standing debate whether uh, non-Muslims in the peninsula can use the word Allah. 
and there's also been a, a number of other important uh, discussions such as potentially tabling a bill to increase the scope of the powers of the Sharia courts. The Prime Minister also welcomed controversial Islamic figures like Indonesian Ustaz Abdul Somad. The firebrand preacher considers suicide bombing a form of martyrdom. I am doubtful that all these efforts for Anwar to pander all the way to the right would actually pay off as he wants. And an Islamization, PH and BN can never outdo PN. So if Anwar keep on moving to that direction, PN can move further to draw out the distance. So much so that Anwar wouldn't get much more Malay Muslim votes. This has left some minority voters feeling disillusioned. At a dialogue just before the state elections, a young Indian student asked about reforming pro-Bumiputra racial quotas in tertiary education. It's the government's responsibility to try and accommodate. The tabi, when you start talking about quota, then you antagonize and alienate the majority in this country and we all will suffer at the process. The Prime Minister's answer did not impress first-time voter Yuvan Sundaram. To see him fight so long and then to get into power and then tell an Indi Indian student that no, you have to understand that that is not how this works, kind of like hurt at the end. Because I remember what he used to say during his uh, speeches and what he stood for during his speeches and then to see him come here and be the neutral party, it kind of makes little to no difference. But anecdotally, some Malaysians have seen improvements in equality. I've been talking with my friends, with my friends who are non-Malays, you know, and um, multiracials. They have their own perspective how they are being given or the offers that were made to them are better compared to the past government's offers. And this includes scholarship, UPUs, and also matriculation program. So this kind of initiatives, I think, slowly erase the discrimination part and it fits the policy made by Prime Minister Anwar for the social justice for all. We cannot risk uh, our multiracialism of this country because it will never bring us any benefit and we are very focused on that. Of course, uh, it is not easy um, being um, government, a very diverse government um, versus a very, uh, like I said, single, single race um, coalition like Prikata Nasional. But we have to give some time to especially the government to prove themselves. We also have to give some time for AMNO in this battle. One way for the government to please everyone, regardless of race, is to improve the economy. After all, voters were most concerned about economic issues going into the 15th general election. On this front, how has the Prime Minister fared in his first year in charge? Life has been difficult for landscaper Azmi Abdul Malik since becoming a single father two years ago. Bulan sebelas tahun 2021 dapat panggilan daripada hospital menyatakan isteri saya dah meninggal sebab sakit buah pinggang selama empat tahun lah. Isteri suri rumah jaga anak-anak itu bila macam isteri dah pergi. Maksudnya macam anak-anak yang yang ada sekarang ni macam tak ada orang jaga, macam kos tinggi untuk membayar sini bayar itu kan. Nak bayar anak lagi, nak hantar anak lagi, hantar anak sekolah lagi, transport semua, bayar semua. Jadi macam memang terkesanlah memang rasa macam kita pening. Recently, the father of three has noticed his day-to-day -day expenses creeping up. 
Saya rasa kalau dulu, walaupun gaji saya RM1,500, tapi komitmen macam kita makan untuk belanja semua tu saya rasa masih boleh kita cover lagi. Tapi sekarang kalau bagi saya lah bawa duit RM50 kita beli barang pun memang tak dapat banyak yang apa yang kita beli. Ha, dari segi macam barang-barang dapur kan. Kita bawa RM50 pun kalau kita beli beras ha, tak campur yang lain okey. Tapi kalau kita beli beras, barang-barang lain ayam ke sayur ke ikan ke semua Memang lebih daripada target RM50. Azmi's predicament is a symptom of Malaysia's economic woes. In 2022, the country rebounded from the COVID-19 pandemic with a stellar 8.7% increase in GDP. But Malaysia's growth has since stalled. If you look at last year, of course, it was a strong growth. Uh, and on a, on a very low base. Um, and for this year, the target will be 4%, um, given the macroeconomic challenges. It started off with the uh, war in Ukraine, and thereafter there was a series of interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserve and other many jurisdictions, including in Europe, uh, that causes uh, extreme volatility in the commodities markets, exchange rates, and also the financial markets. When Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim took office, he appointed himself Finance Minister, reprising a role he held over three decades ago. To show his commitment to cost of living concerns, Anwar gave up his salary, cut ministerial salaries by 20% and refused a newly purchased Mercedes as his official car. Still, appointing himself a Finance Minister was seen as a controversial move. There's been a long-standing position on the part of Pakatan Harapan to separate the position of Prime Minister and Finance Minister. One big criticism that Najib had when he was Prime Minister was that he also appointed himself as the Finance Minister and that's what led to the 1MDB scandal. But then when Anwar announced his cabinet, he appointed himself as the Finance Minister as well. And that kind of doesn't give enough, for me, I feel like power separation, so then who is going to approve your financial decisions? You yourself. Despite his critics, Anwar launched the Madani Economy Framework, aimed at achieving seven targets within 10 years. Among these targets are for Malaysia to be one of the world's top 30 largest economies and top 12 in the Global Competitiveness Index. We had two critical policies, uh, strategic policies that was also announced that will hopefully give the right, uh, the roadmap towards Malaysia achieving where it should uh, achieve uh, based on economic modernity framework. One of course the national energy transition roadmap and the other one is the national industrial master plan. Industrial master plan uh, entails or focus on, on a manufacturing sector. Uh, in terms of timeline, uh, they are looking at seven year timeline from this year until 2030 whereby uh, key industries such as uh, aerospace, electronic and electrical, uh, chemical industries are among the key drivers for industries within IMP purview. Uh, whereas uh, the NETR uh, is a plan or, or roadmap to uh, allow the transition uh, of energy sector towards that is more sustainable, uh, whereby um, you can see the share of uh, uh, renewable energy will actually increase over time from the current 3.9%. These plans will hinge on foreign investments. Over his first year in office, Anwar travelled to 14 nations, including the United States, China and Saudi Arabia. So far, Malaysia has attracted notable investments from brands such as American Goliath's Tesla and Amazon Web Services, German semiconductor firm Infineon and Chinese automobile maker Geely. I think the, the incoming investment coming from this uh, high-tech company such warrants for uh, technology transfers and we know uh, we need that kind of uh, labour supply or labour market condition that could actually help to uh, provide a better job opportunities especially among the youngsters. But domestically, the government faced several headwinds in the last year. In a 12-month period, the ringgit fell from 4.57 to 
to 1 US dollar to 4.7 to 1 US dollar. Coupled with prices of goods and fuel rising globally, this has meant creeping cost of living for Malaysians. The cost of doing business is also rising. A survey by the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers found that most costs had increased by up to 20% in the first half of 2023. Wink Liu started Riri Coffee a year ago, selling coffee and fruit tea in Putrajaya. Sumantra so there are various factors like, that can cause inflation to increase. Our dependencies on imports for food, that could be one of the main factors. We see that uh, from our estimates also, is, there's a, quite a strong correlation between the weakening of uh, our ringgit and also the food inflation. So there is a need obviously to uh, boost up our productions for agriculture. In some cases, rising business costs get passed on to consumers. While it has slowed, food inflation has continued throughout Anwar's first year in office, ranging from 3.9% to 7.3%. Terlalu mahal. Sekarang pun beras pun dah cecah 40 ringgit uh, yang 10 kilo. Uh, itu memang terasa beban sangatlah. Memang rasa kecewa. Sebab uh, macam kita perlu yang rakyat perlu kan macam tak di pandanglah jadi macam terasa memang memang bebanlah memang berat like its predecessors Anwar's government launched the Rama cash aid scheme spending 8 billion ringgit or 1.7 billion US dollars this year to help the poor deal with the rising cost of living but ask me things more can be done dulu kalau zaman perikatan nasional Pemohonan segala macam ibu ah, bapa tunggal ah, ada peruntukan dibagi. Ah, contohnya macam kita bagi ah, buat isi borang, lepas tu kita hantar ke pejabat-pejabat mana pun dia akan ada peruntukan 500 untuk bapa tunggal lah. Start pada bulan 10 sebelah ni kita dah on ah, dia information bagi borang kan. Tapi setakat ni memang tak ada information lah, memang tak ada apa-apa berita senyap, tak ada apa-apa clue. In June, Anwar pledged to eradicate hardcore poverty in 2023. In Malaysia, those who earn a monthly income less than 1,169 ringgit or 248 US dollars are classed as hardcore poor. According to Malaysia's Deputy Minister of Economy, the number of hardcore poor households decreased by around 6,500 between December 2022 and May 2023. The People's Income Initiative, or IPR, is one long-term scheme aimed at eliminating hardcore poverty. 28-year-old Amiruddin Ahmad has participated in the IPR's Food Entrepreneur Initiative since its inception. So, Basically, uh, we woke up at 4 to 5 and then we prepare the food uh, 6 a.m. to move from the house to the vending machine. And then 7 a.m. Uh, we stock, stock up the vending machine and then after that, me and my wife, we go to work uh, respectively. He sells food in vending machines strategically placed in transport hubs and schools. The government fully funds the cost of operating the vending machines. So we so sell like uh, nasi goreng, mi goreng, uh, some kuih, and assorted buns, and of course mineral water daily. So per day, roughly I would say, can earn about 80 to 120. We can earn, you know, some extra to buy some groceries. Let's say at the end of the month, your salary is running out. 
So this kind of money actually very helpful for us. Malaysia's Minister of Economy, Rafizi Ramli, says participants of the Food Entrepreneur Initiative are expected to be lifted from poverty in two years. I think the government is trying to um, promote entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is something that can help uh, our uh, society to you know, experience what we call that as a social outward mobility. La. But the question is, how long can that last? So whether it is sustainable. So much of that effort may depend on uh, luck, on how international events unfold. In October, Anwar tabled the nation's budget for the coming year. Will it help Malaysia weather the storms of a gloomy global economy? Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim has been at the helm of government for one year. Now the state government elections have taken place. The current government should have the bandwidth to begin looking at certain important reforms and will not need to be second-guessing itself all the time. Signals of the government's priorities can be seen in the 2024 budget delivered in October. At 393.8 billion ringgit, or 83.6 billion US dollars, it is Malaysia's largest ever. 2024 will be critical because that's when this new budget that he's uh, tabling will come into effect and to see whether or not it gets implemented uh, and how well things get done. Anwar has inherited a government that's barely breaking even. So he needs to boost uh, government revenue and in order to do so, he needs to uh, ensure that the Malaysian economy continues to grow at a faster pace if possible. Over the last 30 years, debt seems to have grown by about 8% per annum on average, while revenue has only grown by about 3% per annum. With an eye on easing the cost of living, an anticipated revival of the goods and services tax did not materialise. The Prime Minister himself have in many occasions uh, talked about uh, how he believed that uh, that form of taxation, consumption tax, you know, uh, is a tax that is most efficient and wide, something that we need to look at. But he mentioned that the timing uh, is important. We need to increase that, we need to increase household income uh, before uh, we implement uh, something uh, like GST. Instead, Anwar elected to fundraise through other means. The government actually announced that services tax will, rate will be increased from 6% to 8%. And there are also the uh, uh, capital gains tax, uh, tax on luxury goods, and also tax on, on sugar from 40 cents to 50 cents. I think the attempt to raise SST to 8% from 6% will have a bearing, of course, on the poor too, for example. The poor also buy shirts all sorts of things they buy. So the impression given uh, against GST is GST is the only one that can tax the poor and SST won't. It, it's not true at all. To soften the blow of its planned tax hikes, the Unity Government will allocate more money to expanding support schemes like Rama Cash Aid. And in a move lauded by analysts, Anwar announced plans to tighten diesel subsidies, promising to redistribute the resulting funds to the poor. Compliance is very low here. Massive amount of, say, diesel, subsidized diesel, is swapped by fishermen for fish. And that involved 3.3 million, according to the Prime Minister when he presented it. Subsidies are meant for that group. See that only that group enjoys, otherwise you'll have free riders. If you look at the budget, uh, it is a budget that wants to balance growth, that wants to balance fiscal responsibility, and he wants more fiscal discipline to reduce fiscal deficit uh, gradually from 5 to 4.3 percent, for example. Just two days before his budget was tabled, Anwar's parliament passed the Public Finance and Fiscal Responsibility Act. It limits the Minister of Finance's use of discretionary powers to influence a government spending. Obviously, more needs to be done. But so far, the recent announcement on uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act, they give certain timeline 
for them to to actually adhere with all those uh, parameters within three to five years. Such parameters will help to at least alleviate the concerns among the credit rating agencies. The main distrust that people have towards government relates to government performance and I think governments around the world are really having a tough time to show that globalisation works, that democracy delivers. A lot of, I think, success or failure depends on how the Malaysian economy performs and how it reaches uh, perhaps the bottom 70% of Malaysian society. Having survived the first year as a unity government, Prime Minister Anwar must now convince his countrymen of his vision, especially Malay voters. We've gone through years of trying to convince the Malay that, look, multiracialism can work without uh, affecting, uh, especially what being viewed as the Malay uh, rights and privilege and all. Uh, so the same challenges now being faced by UMNO that they are trying to you know, reinvent themselves, reinvent the narrative and try to convince the people. We have hit the rock bottom of the Malay support and we are looking forward to the support increasing in the future. But the government must perform. Datuk Sri Anwar must perform. Datuk Sri Anwar must deliver to the Malays what they want so that you know, UMNO can also justify the uh, coalition, combination with PH. Anwar Ibrahim's journey to the peak of Malaysia's government has been a long one, since his tenure as Deputy Prime Minister three decades ago. After overcoming imprisonment, party defections and political backstabbing, he is now one year into the top job. Has Anwar delivered? I give Anwar 7 out of 10 for what he has achieved given so many of his limitations. 6.5. 8.5? 6 out of 10. 5 pun saya tak boleh bagi. Saya bagi 4 saja. So on the positive side, seizing the moment, making or for, forging a larger coalition, uh, hammering out a cabinet that actually brought together all the different interests, staying in power on the negative, I would say a lack of urgency, a lack of a clear plan at the beginning to structure decisions, as well as some strange cabinet appointments. I think he's doing quite good um, in regards to the initial plans and uh, initial implementation to the policies. I'm giving him an A for effort because he's doing a lot of work trying to market the country. On the area of governance, I would say that he's probably doing a C because it's not moving fast enough to ensure that uh, the process is transparent enough and also meeting the public needs. After years of a revolving door government, Prime Minister Anwar's year in charge marks progress towards a milestone. Once the government is able to survive the first term and then it's able to uh, stand on its own to contest the next election, then I think it's going to have a multiplier effect, particularly on the mindset of the civil service. If the civil servants uh, has made up their minds that oh, this government is going to stay, then I think uh, the pace with which uh, reforms take place and policies get implemented will hasten and then that can uh, bring the desired positive change that the country needs. And this means expectations will be even higher heading into the second year and beyond. If we survive these next five years, I would expect uh, there would be greater unity among races and religion simply because um, a Prime Minister of a multiracial party is in power. In the coming year, instead of his focus being towards staying in power. His focus should be on the people and his focus should be on uplifting the community. I would love to see a zero corruption practice 
no matter where it is, whether it's from government or governmental agencies or government leading companies. Saya mengharaplah kerajaan sekarang ni kalau boleh salurkan bantuan secara cepat lagi bagus, meningkatkanlah naikkanlah pendapatan swasta, pekerja swasta ni kan bagi mengelakkan inilah masalah-masalah macam harga barang semua kan komitmen. Jadi boleh kita bertahanlah untuk menjalankan hidup seharian inilah.